digital series and I must thank people for joining in not just in hundreds but literally in thousands huge audience and a very enthusiastic one with lots of questions which we have not been able to accommodate and I I think that may happen even today uh, but what we try and do is get management gurus to give us the benefit of their experience and their knowledge on a range of subjects. Uh, today's subject is very interesting and very re very relevant for today's times, which is how good management practices nurture the environment and sustainability. We got a terrific panel. There's Arun Myra, author and management consultant, who was part of the planning commission and was chairman of the Boston Consulting Group. There's Naina Lal Kidwai, chairman India Advisory Board, Advent Private Equity. She was country head of HSBC Bank and president of FICI. And to conduct the discussion is James Crabtree, with, who people in Bombay know very well as the Financial Times correspondent for many years. In his book, the Billionaire Raj won the Tata Literature Live Business of Book of the Year Award a couple of years ago. Now he's a full-time author and an academic. James, I'm handing the mic over to you. There you go. But before that, let me just say that in the end, when we have a Q&A, uh, there'll be Starbucks vouchers for the best questions. And this Tata click which from which you can order the books of Naina Lal Kidwai, Arun Mehra and James Crabtree. Over to you James. Thank you, you James. My apologies. There we are. I'm off mute. So my name is James Crabtree. Many thanks for joining us this evening. Um, it's seven o'clock in the evening here in Singapore, which is where I'm sitting. Uh, I know it's four thirty in uh, in India. We're going to be talking for the next hour on the subject of how good management practices can nurture uh, environment and sustainability. So let me just set the scene for this for about a minute. Um, this was already before the coronavirus pandemic, a critical moment for India's environmental future. India is the world's third largest emitter of carbon. It will, in a, in a couple of decades time, be the world's most populous country. It's widely accepted um, amongst climate experts that if India follows a path of development that is as carbon intensive as China, it's going to be all but impossible for the world to achieve any kind of sustainable target um, close to two degrees of warming. But even without that, there are a host of other challenges that India faces that all of you will be very familiar with. Um, air pollution and air quality being one that has risen up the political agenda over recent years, water and water shortages with droughts in many parts of the country, plastics and plastic pollution at a time in which the global plastic recycling system um, is in crisis, and biodiversity to name but four. Now, all four of those areas uh, are complicated by what's currently happening with the coronavirus pandemic. It means that the government, which previously had been focused on areas like renewable energy, is going to be less so. Uh, and it means there's going to be less money to go around. And it also means that business is distracted. And that's the focus of our discussion this evening. What has been the record of Indian business and Indian business leaders on the environment and sustainability and what needs to change in order for India to achieve its objectives in this area. And so it's with that that I'm going to turn to Arun and Naina to kick off the discussion. The way we're going to run this discussion is we're going to run it purely in Q&A style um, as a discussion for about 40 or 45 minutes. And then for the remaining uh, 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to take questions from the audience. So as you go through, please feel free to leave questions in the chat function on Microsoft Teams. And uh, as uh, um, Anil said the, the best five questions will get uh, a prize from Starbucks and we'll ask them at the end. So 
Lots to dig into in this. Uh, Arun and Naina, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Let me start by asking the same question briefly to both of you, which is, what's the problem here? Uh, if we're saying, how can good management practices nurture the environment and st sustainability, underlying that is a, is a question, which is, something's not quite working here. Business isn't quite doing what we, we had hoped that it was doing. So can you tell us, uh, Arun first and then Naina, what do you think the problem is that we're trying to solve? Arun. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, what's the problem we're trying to solve? The problem we're trying to solve is how we think about our responsibilities uh, in the world, businesses as well as policymakers. As you pointed out, India uh, has been doing very badly. All the years that India was celebrating that we were the fastest growing a free market democracy, the time I was in the planning commission, uh, we found, we had an international agency do a study for us about comparing India to all its peers, the BRICS countries, the ASEAN countries, and India's South Asian neighbors. How were we doing in terms of growth? And what they showed us was that while our growth was faster than almost either all countries other than China, we were doing the worst, even compared to Nepal, uh, our neighboring country, and every other country around us in the ASEAN. Why? Because for every unit of growth, we were destroying the environment more than anybody else was. For every unit of growth, we were producing the least number of dignified jobs. And as you said, we are a country with the largest number of young people to be engaged. And unless our economy is going to generate good work, dignified work, for our young people, we are not going to even grow the economy. And we were damaging the environment much more than every other country with, along with our, our own growth. So it was like this. We had our policy makers with the corporation sitting beside them in the front seat, directing the, the, the growth of the economy, a big bus. And pressure was always press the accelerator, get to two trillion, then five trillion, move this big bus, faster and faster. The people inside the bus, sitting inside the bus had safety belts and they had uh, airbags and they were even being served, you know, French wine and cheese to be comfortable as they traveled. There were people clinging onto this bus on the top and on the sides and we weren't even aware of them. And when, with the pandemic, the bus had to be suddenly stopped, we all got alarmed. Where did these people come from on the road? They collapsed right around us. They were part of this growth journey, but they were not getting the benefits of the growth that some of us, many of us, were able to get. So there was a frame of mind here about the people who were driving growth. What were the instruments that were looking at? There were two instruments they were paying attention to. One was GDP and the stock market, the corporations paying a lot of attention to the stock market. And these two instruments weren't giving the information about what is happening to the environment, what is happening towards uh, jobs, inclusion, wages, and the availability of health facilities for people around. We weren't even aware of those things because we weren't paying attention to them. Our growth model was so focused on GDP, and I'm saying corporate growth, so focused on shareholder value that we lost sight of, that our bus was actually destroying the environment, running fast over the grass, killing green shoots of grass, digging into the earth, damaging the earth, and as I said also, just not carrying people along. They were so vulnerable and they've fallen in front of us now. Very good. Uh, so that, that's a very nice um, way of framing the discussion. And Naina, you have a, a finance background in, in particular, but also, I mean, in a sense, you know big Indian industry because you were, you were head of FICI. What, what's your sense of the record here? What, 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 what's, uh, how, how, how should we judge India's business record in this area? I want to just start by uh, Arun always paints these lovely pictures uh, and I just hope that that bus is going to be an electric bus uh, very, very quickly fueled by renewable energy to help with uh, the way we see this going forward. And the good news is that there are regulations of this order which are coming into our cities with the desire to make public transport uh, uh, on uh, electric, uh, in electric mode. But uh, to just back off, uh, I like to look at this because, you know, I've worked in the sustainability space now for the last 10, 12 years. And some of the global work uh, which informs some of my thinking comes from uh, the work of the new climate economy, which has done 
uh, a lot of data out there to show that growth and sustainability actually go hand in hand. And it would be very important for Indian policymakers to recognize that uh, uh, the environment uh, it does not provide breaks in that growth story. Uh, and therefore, we do need to ensure that we can work this together. So what is it that uh, we need to do as we look at this problem? Uh, I put this into two buckets. One is the large, well-informed companies uh, who get driven by a bunch of stakeholders, which I'll just touch on. And the second is the MSNEs, which are really the mass of Indian employers and business. And uh, they tackle and come into this problem in a very different way. So of the large guys, uh, what begins to drive their thinking? Uh, uh, often, I think, just informed, uh, well-informed uh, CEOs, executive committees. But the good news is what's driving them is also large financial investors, particularly global investors. I sat on global boards where the, we have received letters, never threatening, but letters from large investors like Norges Bank and others, uh, you know, Blackstone, who 10 pages of this is what we want you as board members to ensure the company is moving along. They're not saying we're not going to invest, but I think that's the hidden threat there, right? So any of our listed companies and where the foreign portfolio investors that come into them have to be extremely mindful about investors and the way they will actually not even invest in some sectors or will certainly not invest in companies that are not seen as embracing this. So that drives good practice. The second one, which large companies are very sensitive to, and I think multinationals, uh, uh, maybe even more so, is communities around their factories. So I can't afford to pollute the water around which I work. I want to make sure that the health of my people in the factory is maintained and therefore to ensure it, the villages around which uh, that factory exists, my workers come from those villages. So doing what I have to in terms of being a responsible citizen outside of the fence, whether it is to do with water, whether it is to do with hygiene, is self-serving, yes, but it's a win-win. It helps the community, it helps me. So investors, community, to some extent banks, uh, certainly the foreign banks have long had norms in terms of industries that they will not lend to in terms of pollution and sustainability. There is now a code amongst Indian banks as well, which could be stricter, could be better. Some of us worked on it. It took a real long time to get it out of the IBA and RBI, but it's there, at least as a platform of, hey, this is about ensuring that we as banks have to have a base standard under which we will not lend. So that on the large side, on the MSME side, it's a, it's a different story. It's, there are regulations. The regulations are seen as too strict. And I will just end this by quoting a story of sitting in, uh, in fact, Bombay Airport uh, not very long ago, well before COVID, as you can imagine. And <laughs> a guy came up to me, uh, unknown to me, and he just said, hey, are you uh, Nainala Kidwai? And could I just have something to talk about. So I sat down. And uh, even uh, before, you know, we could, uh, he could introduce himself, launch straight into uh, the fact that he has uh, a company in an industrial zone uh, in Delhi. And the norms that are required in terms of uh, uh, whether it is waste or sewage treatment uh, are so high and expensive for each industry, each company in there to get it right. He says, I just today... As you know, India was already heading into uh, uh, in an industrial slowdown. Uh, he had explained how he had had to cut his workforce by half and revenues were down by half. That what he needed was for that entire industrial zone to come together. He said, I'm willing to pay for the service that somebody provides to me to help me meet these norms. I can't do it myself. It's the cost. It's the effort. It's the ability. And so what you then get is a small, his heart in the right place, uh, I would say there was little reluctance, it was just the inability, and as he looked to solve the problem, I suspect the way he would get around it was just pay the inspectors that came around. So we have to make sure that the compliance norms that are set are realistic, and also solve for the infrastructure in a way that we don't pin it on every small company, 
but there is a responsibility of government to also establish that network and make people pay for it. Very good. So was it, let, let's take the bigger companies first. So um, in, in a sense, the, 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 the big Indian names that, that we're all familiar with. Arun, I mean, is there a sense that, that we've got to a stage where the, the captains of Indian industry now pay lip service to sustainability, but actually don't do very much about it? I mean, you're a management consultant. You have to work with these companies as they try and cut cost in a market where consumers demand very cheap products and therefore you can't have lots of extra spending. So, I mean, how committed have you found uh, the chief executives and leaders of India's big companies to be on environmental matters? Um, they'd like to be seen to be uh, very responsible. Um, so how would they express what they're doing so that amongst the peers, in the audiences where they want to appear, that they are responsible, they will look good. So they are talking about the same language about environmental responsibility that would apply perhaps in Europe, perhaps in the United States about responsibility for, in the terms that uh, are used there, you know, less carbon in our products and, and our processes and so on. As Naina said, what about the people of India? How is the environmental problem being faced by them? And what is the language they understand and the language in which they can convey to you what you have to do? So our uh, corporate chiefs are not really listening to the people and the system around themselves. They're listening to each other. They're like in a cocoon and you know, talking to each other about the things they do. And rather than being accounting to the people. So we had, I'm coming to the good things, some years ago, when I was in the planning commission itself, some responsible people in the corporate world, the big guys, as well as some people in the NGO world who wanted to work with them and support them, and the Ministry of Corporate Affairs newly set up said, why don't we create a scorecard that Indian companies would voluntarily apply to themselves to judge whether they are environmentally and socially responsible in the Indian context. Okay, so they developed a set of national voluntary guidelines these were developed by Indian industry, but they haven't been adopted. Why not? Why not? Because just at that time, someone came with the idea that actually this is very messy. If companies are going to have to measure themselves against environmental requirements as well as social requirements, even though they have devised it themselves and responsible companies like Tata were in the four, this and some others, Oh, it's going to be so messy for the others. You know, they'll have to set up departments to look at how they are uh, doing and report those matters out in public. And they don't want to do that. So we got a better idea. Why don't we just ask the companies to give 2% of their profits every year towards CSR in the villages around or wherever they wish to do it. And that's enough. And this is completely conceptually wrong because that 2% is really a painkiller's for the pain that the corporate operations themselves quite often have caused the environment, the harm to the environment and to society. Carry on producing your revenues at 100% in the way you are misusing resources of the environment, not creating good jobs and so on. And 2% of your profits, and that may be 0.2% of your revenues, so long as you spend that on good things, you're excused. You're a good guy. Right. It's a small great. It's a very nice point. I mean, sort of, so underlying this is the point that in order to reach the kind of objectives that we need to reach, it's not enough simply to do CSR. You need to transform your business processes in various complicated ways that are often expensive. I mean, Nina, could you talk to us a little bit about how more in the context of the coronavirus and the, the economic recession which is going to follow, how much more challenging does this become? I do want to talk about, in a sense, what we think needs to happen and what the opportunity is, but I want to be realistic about the, the terrain on which we're having this discussion. So how much harder is it now than it was four months ago? Yeah. So, uh, uh, James, if I can just pick up uh, also from where Arun uh, stopped to look at an area, a uh, couple of areas that I work closely in, which is water and sanitation. And uh, this comes directly into the uh, coronavirus uh, space for two reasons. 
One is, uh, you know, every, every speech today is about washing hands. Uh, so, you know, how do you wash hands if you don't have uh, water? So uh, water is very key to everything we do going forward. And the second is just general hygiene, which is the whole sanitation space anyway. And uh, in, in a funny sort of way, well, I was beginning to worry that some of the effort at Swachh Bharat Mission on the sanitation and hygiene front would, would wane because government had achieved uh, a fair bit under the uh, open defecation free space. Uh, and was beginning to move much more into plastic waste management, that some of the good work would just drop off. Oh, I think we've lost Nina for a minute there, so uh, let's see if she's going to come back. If not, we'll go back to you, Aaron, basically with the same question about COVID, and then we'll come back to Nina when her connection picks up. But, uh, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you read the, the kind of situation that we have now facing a crunching economic recession and a government that is going and business that is very focused on on managing this disease how much more complicated does it make our situation actually it's making our dilemma very stark the dilemma very stark on one side we must prevent people dying from covid at the same time we must ensure that uh, uh, people dying from other diseases as well as uh, you know poverty and uh, starvation that should not increase. In fact, many more people were dying of poverty and uh, starvation and, and the poor incomes in our country than can die of COVID or have been dying of COVID. It's a very small fraction compared to the other. So in the solution that we find for preventing the spread of COVID, we mustn't uh, you know, cause more people to die for other reasons. This is where the system view must come in. We must look at many things interacting with each other and then find a system solution which improves general overall well-being, not merely keep people safe from COVID. Okay, mentioned and prevent them. And this is where coming to business. And in India right now, it's more to do with not the environment immediately. Environment is fortunately taken care of because of the suspension of large business activities. It's blue skies and twittering birds. It's all very nice, but the livelihoods of people are very sharply affected so is being asked to keep paying people even if they cannot operate so people have money to buy food and to carry on their other essentials uh, our business say we don't have the money to pay them so you've got to provide relief to us and this comes to that dilemma again that are people existing to enable businesses to produce profits for themselves or do businesses exist to enable people to earn money and to live good lives. So this matter about labor laws and payment of wages has become fortunately being understood in the right way now. Until the run up to this time, businesses were clamoring for and almost getting away with saying, please make labor laws easier for us. Allow us to fire when we need to and we will hire when we need to. The problem in India was 95% of the people were living like that. They were on very temporary, very uncertain contracts anyway. So the business didn't need further freedom to hire and fire people. But very good. Hmm? Oh, so oh, no. Now, now the, I'm saying is this is where the Overton window, to use that concept, in the public discourse, things which could not be considered seriously, like I think we need more social security rather than more freedom to business to hire and fire, has become the front pages of our discussions. And I'm so glad about it. Yeah. Very good. Okay, that's a, that's an optimistic point. Welcome back, Nina. Uh, te technological gremlins as ever. So you were in the middle of an answer talking yes. about how you saw the COVID outlook. Yeah, so, so I was just uh, highlighting how the water and sanitation story has fortunately stayed squarely in there. And I can certainly speak for the company's boards I'm on. There has been no scaling back on efforts in terms of the work they're doing with the communities around them. They're not saying, hey, our profits are going to be lower, so we're going to cut back on those programs. Uh, so, again, because of the win that comes with working with the communities around the factories, which uh, are critical to you, uh, that, I think, does not get impacted. If at all, there's an added effort because there's an ownership by that factory of the communities around it to make sure that the virus doesn't spread around where it exists. 
And I think there, it, we have to look at these win-wins, quite honestly. Uh, while the way industry looks at the way it plays in terms of its responsibilities in India uh, and to the growth of the country as a whole is all nice to hear. The practical part of it is uh, that there will always be the dilemma of profit returns and doing the right thing on sustainability. But there are many intersection points which are win-wins. And I think we have to find those and work on those. Uh, I think another way of looking at this is it's not just about CSR. It has to be in the DNA of the organization. And that DNA comes from, am I the most water efficient company in the way I use the water? And the good news here is that we've seen only because of water shortage, actually, so it's a win-win. Uh, wastewater uh, uh, is uh, recovery is a very big subject. And uh, there's, I'm actually amazed as to how many companies every day uh, we are documenting at the Fiki Water Mission on how successfully they are looking at the water recovery space. Not so much so that they give water back into the community, uh, not just take from uh, water bodies around. So you will get these sort of win-win intersections which we need to drive. And I think the one that probably doesn't get enough attention is pollution, which had a very nice ring to it because citizens felt it. Citizens wanted the change. Citizens were going to be saying, hey, uh, it's, it's all very well blaming farmers in Punjab for burning uh, the stubble. But we also want to look at the vehicle we drive and to make sure that it isn't seen as polluting, uh, let alone being polluting, that I want my city to, to ensure that transportation, public transportation is clean. I am worried about the way my child uh, exists in this environment. And so when the citizen begins to require that accountability, and that isn't just of the corporate, it's an accountability from the politician, it's an accountability of the way we ourselves behave, and that whole urban infrastructure requires change. Uh, how is it that we transport people back and forth? And the work from home is a quantum leap in that direction. Some of us have been re requiring and looking at this, whether it was from more women coming into the workplace, which, which was a very nice uh, theme. But the other was uh, also unnecessary travel back and forth. And in one big swoop, this COVID virus has been leave behind the legacy of far less air travel and far less transportation of people back and forth because of this ability to work from home and uh, better and better digital connectivity. So I do think that going forward, uh, we can tackle some of these by getting the messaging right at the right moment. And I do think COVID provides us that opportunity. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So we, we sort of talked now for some of our time about the problem a little bit. And now I, you want to come in, Arun, but let me just yes, sort of... Very importantly. Before, uh, before you do, I just I want now to sort of turn broadly towards the solutions. I just wanted to say we've got some questions coming in as well from the audience, which I can see on my other screen here. So please do ask questions. You might get one of these Starbucks prizes. So Arun, briefly, you wanted to come in on something Nina said, and then we'll move on. Which is going to be a solution. You know, Naina said that when the citizens become became alarmed about the pollution, then now we are attending to pollution. When you talk about environment, it's not merely pollution. Fifteen years ago, as I traveled in the country and tried to carry the message of pollution, carbon, and what we are doing to the climate into the villages of the country, they weren't facing, they are citizens too, they weren't having a pollution problem. They were having a water problem. And they said, who is paying attention to this? I'm glad that the water problem has now become, you know, in the consciousness of corporations. It wasn't so. So who are citizens really? And the, my point is in solutions, we must listen to all the citizens of the country. We in the bus, if I might say, are listening to people like ourselves. When we have a problem in the bus, in the city, then we say, oh, we've got to do something about it. When the people out there have a problem, they are citizens. We must get more democracy into our capitalist institutions. Let me, so let me, oh, in, I, have, I want to just add to that on the, how to solve for the problem. And one of them is measurement. So if you look at the pollution issue, until we began to see 
have I lost you guys? No, no we're here. We can hear you. Uh, if uh, that what the, when people began to understand the measurement of that pollution, and actually, if you will remember, initially it started with the embassies in Delhi flagging the issue. We didn't know how bad our air was because we didn't know. And it was only when that began to be put in the public domain that we began to say, hey, this needs to be solved. And the same thing happened with air conditioners in the country. When the rating system, there was a starring system that started and there was obviously a lot of pushback from industry when it started, where if you had an energy efficient uh, AC, it was going to cost 10 or 15 percent more. But at the end of the day, the payback was a couple of years. The minute we put an ethical toolkit for a sustainable world. Now, we don't want to hear the entire story of the book, but in a sense, if Indian business read your book, what would they do differently? What, what, what is it that systems thinking can do for business leaders that will help them to think about this in a different way? Three things, three things, three disciplines. I think businesses in India and around the world must um, uh, get disciplined in three ways. One is, I've already mentioned it, deeply listening to people not like yourself, people who are not the people that you usually listen to and whose metrics you are following and uh, comparing each other against. Please listen to people not like us. And we need to listen to many more. And this is not a skill that business has. In fact, if I want, but we don't have time perhaps to say how Hirschman, the economist in the 1970s, pointed out that Milton Friedman, the man who, of course, went on to business of business is only business, found it very hard. Milton Friedman said, I find it very hard to allow people to speak. They should just put their money where their mouth is and express what they need by paying for it or not paying for it. Now, people who have money can express their needs in that fashion. But people who don't have money, you have to hear them and say, look, you're damaging my environment, you're damaging my society, I don't have a decent job. You got to... And, Milton Friedman called this cumbrous political channels. He said, I don't want cumbrous political channels. I want just economic mechanism and money mechanisms. So we as business people and policymakers must learn to actually listen to other human beings who are not like ourselves. One, what are the second two? The second two points? Two, ethical reasoning. Ethical reasoning. Every religion will say it is not ethical to be purely selfish. You must care for people around yourself and uh, Eastern religions like Buddhism would go further and Jainism and say also treat nature as you are a part of it and you must care for it as much as you care for your own life. Ethical reasoning cannot be selfish and if you use the principle of business or business must only be business and you must care only for the returns of your own owners and shareholders, it's very unethical. So to teach business people and in business schools, don't test all the tools you use with respect to will they produce more profit, will they produce more goodness for people other than yourselves and your business, ethical reasoning. The third is systems thinking. The systems thinking is look at many things together. You must see the consequences of working on one part of the system, how it damages other parts of the system. Big, bold solutions which solve a problem in one area could cause great harm into the whole system. So systems thinking is the opposite of the scientific thinking that we've got so used to, which is you know focus on a part of it, know it thoroughly, get all the data about it, get all the relevant experts and solve it. The SDGs are struggling with this dilemma. They've got 16 goals which require expertise in each of the areas. And so they've got communities working, stakeholders around those areas. But each of these goals interacts with the other goals. You should not solve the water problem without destroying livelihoods and derived by vice versa. And education without you know, uh, enabling people to uh, also uh, have more dignity as they go forth. So these soft things and hard things. So system thinking is something which happens naturally, frankly. Children do it naturally. People who are not educated scientifically do it quite naturally. They see many things together. And they see connections which we in science and logical focus thinking break them apart into silos and okay. solve problems in pieces. Very good. Okay, so that's a, that's a sort of magisterial overview of everyone in the audience should buy Mr. Myra's book. Um, for more. Um, Naina, let, let me sort of, in a sense, move to your area of expertise, which is finance. So you talked a little bit about boards and investors. You said that, that if investors come to companies and say, get your act together, then the leadership listens. But how optimistic are you about the area of green finance um, as a potential catalyst for change in, in this area? 
So there are two ways of looking at this, James. One is that in, in my dream world, all financing should be green. In that uh, you do not finance anything which does not meet a certain uh, base level of uh, being okay. Uh, beyond that, green financing uh, has grown. I think the green bonds market, if you look at where it is today, is uh, it's attractive, it's there. Uh, one of the, the disappointments in India, to my mind, is that the green bond market that uh, we work to create in the country has largely gone into renewables. And why am I disappointed? I'm disappointed because renewables can be used a lot, uh, uh, you know, can use green finance, yes, but we can have green finance available for many other aspects of environment. But the measurement isn't there. So a bank isn't clear what qualifies and what doesn't as green unless we can measure it and put it out there. So if I'm an energy efficient company, I should qualify for green finance. If I want to bring in water efficient equipment, I should qualify for green finance. So we haven't got down to quite that level and it's tended to be much more, you know, at the sort of renewables level, which was good, but uh, I feel we need to do a lot more measuring and put a lot more out there. A second area which I think would be important, which borders on the finance piece, is I as a financier, my job would be a lot easier if every annual report had a proper sustainability uh, uh, sort of report. Right now, some uh, right-minded companies prepare them and they do a very good job. It's, um, you know, there's a lot out there. But I would rather see it in, through the lens of some format which is approved. Uh, and there are many that exist. In fact, I know from the Lafaz Holson board that I sit on that they're looking at, for example, a measure which they call the SBTI, which is Science-Based Target Initiative. So you actually have very clear parameters set out there, which an external agency along with you at the company develop, agree and put out there. So if we mm. all get comfortable looking at companies through the same lens, we know where they sit on that list and that helps determine where we put our money, whether as an individual investor or as a foreign investor or indeed as a bank. So, I mean, think, uh, I mean, so we do need to direct it better. I, mean, I, want to, I want to end by saying that this, it's equally important, particularly for the banking world, to know where it will not let. Let me let me ask a couple of questions, and then we've got got some questions from the audience that I want to go through. I wanted to ask consumers. So, if you're a business, um, typically you think about your your customers. And over the last year before the pandemic, you saw in and outside of India a host of different form new forms of environmental consumer activism, from the Extinction Rebellion movement to the climate sit-ins of Greta Thunberg, um, uh, activism on air, against airlines. Uh, and rise in issues like veganism uh, and plant-based diets. To what extent do you think in India you, you will find corporate India lagging behind its customers who want change um, to, in a sense, more, more desperately than, than the business leaders? Naina, that's a question for you, and then Aaron, I have a different one for you. So I think for a long time in India, we will continue to have what are value-based uh, uh, purchasers people looking at the cost, uh, people uh, ensuring, yes, that there's a minimal quality to it, but the quality will come much more from safety than environment per se. I think the, the young generation, and children in particular, are becoming more and more aware. But are we going to see a movement quite like it, it's happening, to even, you know, particularly in Europe, uh, I think we are still a while away, but it's a very connected world. And uh, if it can fire up the imagination, it needs catalysts. I don't think these things just start spontaneously. It needs some catalysts which bring it together and then others just join the bandwagon. And uh, if those catalysts uh, are, are nurtured and exist, then maybe we will see this happen. I think it will happen. Is it going to happen at the level and the speed at which we've seen Europe embrace it, uh, possibly a little while away? It will remain an urban, uh, educated, middle class sort of activism. I don't think it will be 
a mass activism, which is what I would like to see, where the poor and every individual in the country uh, is part of that movement. Uh, we have seen very successful rural movements, don't get me wrong, the whole Chipko movement which protected trees and uh, a lot of the water body conservation that happens, happens at the village level. So those kind of programs will exist, but for a mass movement, it will, it, India is very, very uh, large, very diverse, there are too many pulls and pressures in different directions uh, to give us, I think, quite the unifying that we are seeing under uh, Greta Thunberg or indeed what happens in Europe. Very good. Let me let me ask uh, Arun before we go to the questions. Uh, another question from outside of India, um, in North America, in Europe, in in parts of Asia. There's a lot of talk about how the recovery from the pandemic uh, can be made more sustainable. The idea of a green New Deal investment as part of the recovery that will turbocharge the path towards a sustainable future. Do you think something of that sort is going to be possible in India as well? I'm thinking of this because of your background with the Planning Commission. You know how the government works and, in a sense, how these big plans are instigated. So can India have a, a kind of Green New Deal in the aftermath of this pandemic? See, we've said already, and Snain has pointed it out too, that uh, the needs of people in India are not exactly the same as the needs of people in different countries of Europe. And it's not that the people in India, when they're saying that they want uh, products which will ensure that uh, their water needs are well met, are being environmentally unfriendly. But that is their priority. They may not be paying attention to you know, products which are produced in processes which don't produce carbon. So we must listen to the system. Okay, and the system, we have to carry it. And certainly in India, we cannot separate the green movement from the people's movement. I sit on the board of WWF, the World Wide Fund for, for Nature. And in India, certainly, they found so much that they have to protect the livelihoods of people. Otherwise, you cannot protect the tigers and the mangroves. So you start with the people must protect their own environment because they care for it. And if you don't understand how they need the environment and use it, and they quite often use it very well, it's industries who come in and destroy it and make them do things which destroy the environment. So you listen to the community and help the community in ways you can to find a sustainable solution for themselves. The solution for the world has to be everywhere. Local system solutions which communities implement and thus we will solve these big systemic problems of the world. Just, Naila is a woman and thank you, we've got a woman in the crowd. We have 63 Nobel Prizes given for economics. So far only two women have got it. The first woman who got it was in 2006, Alina Ostrom. And you know what her work was? About governing the commons. It was people who were governing things which was not the property of anybody. It belonged to everybody in fisheries and forests and so on. We've got to recover that strengthen community governance in our country and the environment will get taken care of. This is the water matters are being taken care of by that. It's not big solutions from elsewhere. It's local solutions which fit into the other needs that people have. Yeah. Very good. Okay. All right. So those are two good answers. I think we've divided our time nicely between the, what the problem is here and, and thrown some ideas together about what we might do about it, which, uh, which I appreciate. Let me turn to the audience questions. So we'll get through as many as we can here. Uh, the first five I'm going to read out are the ones that have won these uh, magical Starbucks vouchers. Not sure if you can go to Starbucks in India at the moment, but let's hope. Uh, so the first one is from Mudit Jain. Um, and, and so this is quite a, a big question. So Amudit says, our way of living is unsustainable. Technology alone can only solve issues like uh, recycling and reusing. He calls them the three R's. But it doesn't reduce our overall environmental footprint, the amount of resources we're taking out of the planet. What, what are your views on this? I think underlying his question is, is something, Arun, that you raised in the beginning about growth and whether or not we can wean ourselves off the idea that we must always grow more quickly. And, and if not, is that, uh, is that in a sense, does it make our task impossible if we're always trying to grow? So what's your view on that? Definitely. Thank you for asking. Technology is a tool and becoming a more and more powerful tool. And like nuclear energy, very powerful. You can use it for evil means and good means. You must be clear about what you're going to use it for. And the people who have the control of the technology must be people you trust that will only use it for good purposes. This, by the way, is the problem with our social media companies. 
It's very powerful the tool, but we are all questioning what are they using this tool for? Well, to make money for themselves and their shareholders, but society is getting damaged. So before we say technology, we've got to come to that earlier question. What do we want to do? What are we trying to achieve? And how would technology help us to achieve that? So just layering technology into the world, like with social media, you can have very bad consequences and not to make the good ones. So let's come back to the question. Let's understand what everybody wants, not just a few of us, who've got our view of you know, good science and good management of the whole, but what do the human beings of our country, I'm saying India mostly, what do they want to create a scorecard out of that, create a scorecard out of that. We in the bus, the people sitting in the front, the big corporations and the government must drive this bus in the way that everyone feels that they're coming along with this bus and their needs are being met. So James, I, I just have another dimension I want to add in here and that is uh, the entire civil society and NGO community because to Arun's point we want communities to take charge of these but communities I find don't naturally take charge you some they often need help to get them organized to take charge and I've seen this whether it's in the slums of Dharavi which uh, it needed uh, a, a couple of not-for-profits working there to organize the women into uh, committees which then looked at water and sanitation. Uh, it's about pulling together uh, the voice in a way that the community aligns around that voice and is able to express what it wants in a meaningful way and to get that voice heard where it matters. And a vibrant civil society becomes very critical in that connect between community and uh, regulators and indeed corporates who want to do the right thing. If I look at corporate programs, uh, uh, that, you know, which are largely at the CSR level, uh, mostly their partners are not-for-profits that implement because the corporate's core work is not about doing the work of water, or sanitation or even education. They in turn, what they do is help upskill and of course, fund those bodies who they then also fortunately mentor and keep an eagle eye out to make sure the money is well spent. So that partnership is very critical. And I, I, I do believe that we in India have a vibrant civil society, but it needs close attention to ensure that it can upscale and grow beyond where it is today and that we don't indeed stamp it out. Very good. Now, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, uh, so this is from Devang Pandya, and it's about the idea of the circular economy, which in a sense links to the previous question a little bit about growth. Um, wh what's your view of the circular economy, and is this an idea that, that corporate India is taking seriously? So I think corporate India is, uh, takes this seriously to the extent that it is a win-win. And I think in many cases, for example, water, it is a win-win. Uh, it can be for other products. Uh, plastic waste is another space where because of the backlash and fear of creating uh, a mess out there, we are seeing the ownership, for example, from FMCG companies to do more about it. Now, they don't all have the answers, but at least they're beginning to look for the answer. Uh, the, uh, so to the extent that we can use product back in a way that works is very, very critical. In sanitation, uh, we have not found all the answers, but the sludge that is left after water recovery has value as fertilizer uh, after treatment, has energy, which uh, in Africa, for example, they even use for cooking. Uh, so these are the technology innovations and solutions Arun talked about which need to be interjected into the system, but it won't happen naturally. And therefore, it will need corporates that think through this, are able to bring in different partners along that cycle to ensure that we can have the circular economy and with the right answers. So I do believe that it is the way to go, but the solutions will have to be tailor-made and found for different uh, products, different uh, uh, methods as well. Very good. I have a question here from Shashi Kote, uh, which is about the, the state. 
So, Aaron, this, I think, goes naturally to you. So, Shashi says, we have many rules to protect the environment, but our compliance is poor and enforcement is poor. We heard earlier from Nino the story about the small businesses that we haven't touched on again, suffering under, in a sense, excessive rules, not too few. Um, so, how do you improve this situation? Again, thinking back to your planning commission days, too many rules, little enforcement. Uh, how do we fix this, Aaron? Yes, uh, we do want to have uh, uh, very few rules, but we must have some rules so that uh, you know everybody is following the rule and no one else is getting harmed as you if you break the rule. So as much as possible, the rules should be devised and implemented at local levels where people understand the rules and the rules apply to them. So therefore, in the country, we have recognized that we've got to have uh, the states have a lot of freedom in matters that land and green and, and labor, which affect people differently in different states. We've also had in our constitution from the beginning that urban local bodies and village local bodies must be empowered and district bodies empowered. We haven't been doing it. And then so we had the two amendments of the constitution in the early 1990, the 73rd and 74th. Once again, deliberately, we've got to empower local communities. Why is it not happening? And this is what we studied then. We know that's the right solution. Both normatively, we want people to be in charge as also scientifically, that only if they find the solutions will the solutions be the right ones and will they adopt and implement them. Why is it not happening? There is this power point. I'm using the word uh, power. The point of power is so much at the center. People at the top, the experts, feel that the people down there don't know they'll make a mess. So I'm going to find the solution for them. And so we had the planning commission and this was it. The planning commission is going to find the solutions for this big complex country, make a big plan in a thousand pages and hope that the people would adopt this plan and all the ministers would adopt this plan. I mean, many people can't even understand what was written in there. And frankly, much of what was written in there wasn't the problems of the people. They're the problems of the people up here. Uh, so we said, let's we change it. The planning must be bottom up. And like Naina's point, Local communities and local districts must plan. We had examples in this country like Kerala. The state of Kerala has been a forerunner in adopting those amendments. They've got district planning being done by the people for the last 20, 30 years. And no wonder that education, public health is far better managed in Kerala than in many other states. Tamil Nadu is the next. Very well done. Karnataka is trying to catch up also in the south. So local devolution by people governing themselves does work. Why does it not work? There are two angles. One, the one Naina mentioned, people who are not used to doing it must be helped to be able to manage their own affairs, use system thinking, set up good governance of themselves, governance of the people, by the people, for the people, not governance by Delhi of the people in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu or somewhere else. The second is we don't let go power. We up there want to be seen as the guys who are in charge. We are giving you the solutions. Please come back to us. We will solve the problems for you. There's a selfishness and an egotism uh, in ourselves as an elite. I'm putting myself into it and I realized it. Yeah. I think I, one of the, sorry, oh, sorry Arun, I didn't want to interrupt you. Are you done? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think a very important stick is finance. Uh, so, you know, if you look at buildings today, the building regulations require that every building have, uh, this is particularly true of new buildings, have an, ST, an FSTP, a treatment plant for sewage. sewage. And when the builder turns the building uh, over to its uh, uh, new customers, uh, it ticks the box and says, okay, I provided this. The quality of the unit uh, is such that it breaks down in six months. And people aren't even aware as to how it's working, not working. Uh, so what we miss there is, on the one hand, a third party audit. But what I would take it a step further and say that if I, as the banker or financier of that building, of that real estate uh, company, uh, can also insist that that third party audit is done every six months and I see that that functioning unit exists and only then do I release the next tranche of money, we can build in some of the checks and balances rather than just have an inspector raj. And I, as a banker, want to make sure that I have a sustainable uh, company out there that's doing the right thing, but is also not going to be one that's going to be shut down by the regulators because it's not doing the right thing. So uh, I, just a, two more quick questions to close. One first to you, Naina, which is about industrial plants. This comes from Ada. 
um, and, and she asks, what can, um, in, in sense, what can you do or what's a, what's a few ideas to improve the environmental sustainability of industrial plants in particular given so much of carbon emissions comes from areas like cement and, and steel. Yeah. So I wonder if you have a few quick thoughts on that. We've only got about two minutes left so they have to be quick. So by definition I think these are two sectors uh, which are by just the way their process is run right now amongst the most carbon intensive. Uh, are they looking at ways of improving uh, the way they work, absolutely. And in fact, we have a couple of excellent examples in India of companies that are the, in cement that are the most energy efficient in the world. So innovation at every point in terms of technology is key. Uh, another way that uh, these industries, one is to be energy efficient and find the technologies that enable them to do that. A second is the product itself. And I know that Lafarge Holson now has done a lot of innovation around products which when used in a building are very good in terms of conserving heat and cold air. So it needs less air conditioning and less heating. So what you get is a consumer that should be happier because their heating bill and uh, air conditioning bill is going to be lower on the one hand and on the other a product which works for the environment. And a third would be that the ability, for example, of a cement plant to use plastic because it's able to incinerate plastic waste at a level which very little else can. So there is a whole organization that has to go around collecting the plastic and getting it to the cement, which is very, very difficult, and the plastic has to be of a certain variety, etc. But there's over 50 million tons of, uh, billion tons of plastic of this order, which is used now by cement kilns across Europe, which uh, basically again helps in terms of removing the mess. So if you, uh, companies can come at this from, very, from different angles, helping to support and uh, uh, you know, create their own sustainability footprint. And believe me, they're also doing it because they're nervous as hell that they're going to have those same uh, activists at their door. So it's good. Or investors who are going to be driving them to do this as well. So all those pressure points help to find those solutions. But the good news is uh, there is a lot of innovation happening in uh, these different ways. Very good. Now, final very quick question, and then I'm going to hand over to Anil just to, to, to say, uh, to wrap things up. But, but Aaron, one final question um, from uh, someone who gives their name as Ways and Words, which is what can we as individuals do for better sustainability. So if you had uh, one idea that you want to leave the audience with uh, for their own personal lives, um, what, what would you suggest that we do to try and uh, improve our own uh, sustainability? Thank before, you. Bhakti, before I don't answer that, James, this is Anil here. Uh, why don't you take five minutes more because there's so many questions. Um, okay, sure. If you want me to do that, that's absolutely fine. Um, so, but Aaron, why don't you why don't you go for, for that that question? We're not going to get through all the questions, I'm afraid, but I can ask a few more. So, uh, Aaron, go. On. I, I, whoever's asked this question, I would like to give um, some coupon of something this person likes. <laughs> if you don't like Starbucks coffee very much, tell me what else you like, and I'll personally like to give it to you. I don't know your name. You know, it is to each of us. Now, we are all concerned, I'm concerned about these big systemic problems of, as you said, the environment and maybe other things about the way women are being treated in my village or the Dalits are being mistreated in my village. I can't solve the problem by myself. I have to create a little community around myself of people who also care for it and together then, six of us can make a bigger difference than I could make by myself to learn to form coalitions around yourself and I bring in therefore my definition of leadership. My definition of leadership is she or he who takes the first steps towards something that she or he deeply cares about. To so start with that, what do you deeply care about? It could be women being oppressed, it could be the damage to the environment. What do you deeply care about? Because then only will you do something to make a difference and take the first steps. And there will be small steps because you are not in a position to take very big steps. You're not a big thing with jig. But take those steps and take them in ways that others wish to follow. And others will wish to follow if they care for the same thing. It's like Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, lots of people followed him to 
help change the world in a very big way he wasn't giving them money to follow to follow the sort of brand and to follow he wasn't using his stick to beat them if you don't follow you'll be thrown out it was they cared and they followed so around yourself be a leader create movements of change around yourself and i found in this country zillions of these and i call these leaders fireflies they bring their own light no one gives them the energy they have it inside themselves but they rise and when many fireflies rise darkness turns to light they are an inspiration and i must say in my country i notice is mostly young women uh, james if i might say so they are the fireflies they are really helping and let's follow them rather than telling them what to do i i just want to add to the point which i uh, wanted to point arun made which i just love which is the one on collaboration and it is actually what drove some of us to set up the india sanitation coalition because collaboration is something we just don't do well uh people coming together uh one corporate learning from another uh and one ngo learning from another each works on this in their own silos and we don't share best practice we don't replicate best practice uh but uh just out there trying to spin the wheels in a way that we keep starting from scratch so i do think the collaboration the learning from best practice the replication of good practice are very important and did, did you have a, a thought on it, on on what uh, so what what we could do individually yes absolutely you know so it, it, i think arun started by saying that as an individual i think you have to go out there and see how we work with others and so i i'm just saying collaborate because otherwise you remain a single firefly to arun's example what you want is to be able to light up a bunch of fireflies up there so which means it's not just about carrying people up with you it's having them be your partners as you rise to solve the problem very good well even though um uh, uh, the 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 voice of anil dakar gave us five more minutes we've actually used up our our five more minutes so I, i'll now uh, Uh, we've now gone a few minutes over but uh, i want to now to turn things back over to anil i'm sorry we had we had a huge number of questions and so we were only able to get through about half a dozen of them but thank you very much to those of you who asked the questions and uh, and thank you to both of our our um, participants for a, for a thoughtful debate and anil let me hand over to you to to close we things up over, but, uh, i want to now to turn things back over to anil i'm sorry we had thank you thank you james for doing a terrific job of piloting that conversation which was fascinating it it brought in big ideas but also brought in some small <clears throat> doable ideas and uh, i'm sure this is going to give rise to a lot of thinking a lot 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 more ideas coming up and possibly we should extend this conversation at a later date as a continuation thank you arun thank you naina and thank you james for a wonderful session thank you Thank you everyone. Thank you.